Okay. Um, welcome back. Welcome to the Department of Art Visiting Speaker Series. Um, I am very pleased to welcome Sarah Greenberger Rafferty to join us this evening. Rafferty's multimedia installation work probes boundaries and extends beyond traditional territories of photography through various media while constructing meaning from the experimental use of image and material. You've seen a little bit of uh, the work on our department site. Um, again, we will have the opportunity to discuss the work with Sarah directly with questions following the presentation. For those of you just joining us for the first time or just as a reminder, um, we're gonna stick to our procedure um, of uh, during the talk, I just ask that you um, enable your cameras, but turn off your mics uh, until the end of the presentation. And, uh, and then when you uh, activate your mic at the end, you'll be able to ask your questions directly. So tonight we're also privileged to have the artist John Opera here joining us and welcoming our guest. John Opera is a professor of photography in the Department of Art here at UB. John is deeply involved in the history, theory, and production of photographic phenomena. We welcome you and thank you for being here tonight. And we look forward to talking with you more as a group after tonight's presentation. Thanks for um, both being here and welcome Sarah. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I'm John Opera, uh, head of the photo area here at UB. And I am, of course, incredibly excited to introduce tonight's guest speaker, uh, Sarah Greenberger Rafferty, born 1978, is an American conceptual photographer and multimedia artist. She is currently based in Brooklyn and holds the position of Associate Professor of Photography and Director of Graduate Studies in Photography at Pratt Institute. Uh, through highly experimental investigations into the material conditions of photography and a keen-witted approach to subjects and symbols, Rafferty's work addresses a broad range of cultural issues around body politics, the evolution of photography itself, uh, contemporary screen culture, as well as structures of hegemony. In a recent review uh, for Art Forum, artist and critic Michelle Grabner writes, her work indulges the quirks and obsessions of professional photography, especially in examining the medium's technical artifacts and quality control methods. But she refrains from sentimentality, lamenting a bygone era of darkroom production, Instead, her photographs underscore an entanglement between analog and digital methods of production. Uh, and slightly paraphrasing New York-based uh, critic Don Chan's 2014 review, there are both Finnish fetish echoes and pictures generation concern trickling through her work, a fascination with the materials that make up surface and a tongue-in-cheek treatment of mass market imagery. But in the end, the works are wholly contemporary. Rafferty carves new ground, taking a wry sideways look at image making traditions widely embraced to this day. Uh, Sarah was included in the 2014 Whitney Biennial and the 2014 Hammer Biennial, in addition to group shows at the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, Oregon, Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego, uh, the Jewish Museum in New York, among many others. Uh, her work is included in the collections of MoMA, uh, the Whitney, the Carnegie Museum of Art uh, in Pittsburgh, the Guggenheim, the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, which has a pretty cool collection, uh, and the Yale University Art Museum, among others. Uh, she is represented by Rachel Ufner Gallery in New York City, as well as Document uh, Gallery in Chicago. And I will also note, it's very much worth noting, uh, that a symposium Sarah organized at Pratt last year was the inspiration for UB Art Gallery's resource binder and reading group, Thinking Through Photographs, organized by UB Art Gallery's head curator, Liz Park. And the second installment of that group uh, meets tomorrow at 5.30 via Zoom. And uh, info for that can be found on the gallery's website. So please check that out. And please join me in welcoming Sarah Greenberger Rafferty. Uh, uh, can I do a reaction here? Oh, you have more reactions than we have um, on your Zoom. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me in this um, corporate grid of Zoom. Um, I just want to thank uh, John and Maximilian for inviting me and organizing this. Um, I believe the invitation and organization dates pre-pandemic. Um, so it's kind of amazing that this is happening. Um, I wanted to let you know that you're welcome to put any um, questions in the chat, but also I'm leaving ample time for um, live and interactive Q&A because um, I think I brought a few less slides than I normally do uh, because of this, this current screen Zoom all day that we're all in. But um, I have to say, you know, I've been teaching uh, for 14 years and um, this semester has been one of the most moving and consequential moments that I've been in the classroom as a student or a professor um, with my students. So it's really cool to see all of you here um, and, and just sort of, you know, everyone doing their thing and showing up. So, um, so thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen. Okay, you should see a black screen. Um, so I brought sort of two sets of slides this evening. Um, the first set are a few recent works in glass that I've made. Um, and in one work, I'm gonna go in depth. Actually, I'm inspired by a colleague, uh, Leslie Hewitt, who's a really important artist of my generation um, who teaches at Cooper Union and invited me recently to her class to do a close reading of a few works of mine. And this, so I really thought about that and um, how the, it's certain things that I never show all this kind of working stuff. So there's sort of something about the Zoom that is disembodied, but also, um, also has a kind of studio visit intimacy. Um, so starting with some works that, that I made this year. Um, I haven't really made much this year. I don't know about everyone else. Uh, there's been some other shit going on. Um, and my studio process got kind of interrupted um, mid-March. It only happened to me. It didn't happen to anyone else in the whole world. And it was pretty disruptive. Um, and I really only thought about it, about my studio. I'm kidding, I'm being sarcastic. Um, anyway, I was in the middle of making a body of work that ended up looking like this. I don't know if it would have looked like this had not been for COVID and I just finished this series of works. Um, and they are simply glass pockets with mounted photographs of um, Sephora makeup testers that become these kinds of um, uh, sort of gridded color studies, um, planets, I don't know. Uh, and it's interesting because I took these pictures of the Sephora actually in late February, early March. Um, and it only occurred to me when I was printing them and deciding to put them in this work that, um, you know, putting our fingers and rubbing them around something in public and then touching our face is never going to happen again. So it simultaneously, like, immediately became a kind of relic of a, of a past culture. Um, and these are used palettes, so you can kind of see the dimensionality. Um, I have some pictures of these in my studio, which will maybe help make it understood how they're made, but it's essentially, uh, you know, 20 inches tall by 20 something inches wide overall by about an inch uh, deep. It hangs on the wall with a cleat and the image is basically um, an inkjet photograph mounted to board and then it sits inside of a glass sort of frame or sleeve. Um, here's uh, an image of two of the works installed on a wallpaper piece that I made um, called Workers and Catalogs. 
this also came out of sort of lockdown scanning, lots of scanning of things that I had um, just laying around. Um, and so I've been doing these wallpapers that be, are sort of um, showing my interest in the photograph as aggregate so that there's not like a singular photograph that's sort of made up of a bunch of photographs becomes a pattern um, and also becomes architectural. So there's a little bit of a closer look and you can see um, it's all these Adobe stock workers going like this or like this. Um, this was also started before the pandemic, but then completed during the pandemic. And then starting to the right of this wallpaper is um, a, a scan of like a catalog of, of uh, promotional products that I had been hanging on to for some dozen of years or so. So you can see that more here. Um, this next piece is a piece that I made um, in basically as a commission for um, a show called uh, Certain Skins that what wait that wasn't the title of it. This skin of ours that was um, curated by Liz Park and uh, this is a 18 panel glass mural. Um, each of those bigger panels are uh, roughly 25 inches by 19 inches and overall it is you know roughly 10 feet by six by five feet and this is just a quick video that shows you the materiality of this piece and this is the piece that I am going to talk a little bit more in depth about. The piece is called the Velt, um, V-E-L-D-T, which is based on the title of a Ray Bradbury sci-fi story about a uh, children's um, sort of nursery technology that would be like a full wall where whatever the, the children would dream about um, it would come true on this wall. And let's just say it doesn't go very well for their parents. Um, and rather than being a direct illustration of this story, um, I was interested in using it as a sort of framework, um, the sort of interactive wall. And I, I really liked the idea, um, you know, getting back to the original of making a sort of static touch screen. Um, all of the imagery is coming from Adobe stock imagery. And it was a search for, um, I believe the search was woman touching screen. Um, and then as a sort of a, a visual, I don't know, if, would be called a visual pun, but I have all these like measurement. I have the big, um, the tape measure and then these little squares or triangles rather that are all one-to-one, 100% -one, scale measurements. And then there are also, um, so you can see that on the right here, there's also buttons because I also really like the idea of having, you know, useless buttons on a, on a giant static touch screen. Um, and the other thing about the sort of woman, woman touching screen, here's an image of, you know, so you can see the reflection of the glass. Um, the image is also an image of a white woman with her back to the audience. And so this piece was made last summer um, for, a number of years been reckoning with the demographic that I'm a part of, which is, you know, white women, um, middle class white women, and realizing that that's a demographic that widely voted um, for Trump and dealing with the idea of thinking really of your own. Um, personal circumstances and not considering yourself a part of a wider community. Um, I wanted to sort of implicate myself and think about this image of the woman with her back to the audience. So that was very important to me. Um, here's the original picture. Uh, 
the image gets on the glass by being transferred to um, a, through a decal process, which is essentially like if you've ever worked in an office and had a copy machine um, and you know that like the big copy machines have toner drums that are kind of like if you ever change the toner, it's like powdery, it gets all over. Um, so the machine has been retrofit so that instead of the powdered toner, there's powdered glass in the drums. And you know how the copies are sort of warm when they come out of the, the printer. Um, they, it takes little uh, glass particles and it sort of seals it to a carrier sheet. Um, and then that goes on the glass. And when you fire it in a kiln, um, the paper burns off and the glass particles, the glass powder melds and fuses with the sheet glass. So it's an image that's actually made 100% of glass. Um, and you can see it has this kind of jaundiced color of the black on the black. Um, so here's the original image. And then the copier decal maker only goes up to 11 by 17. And so this is the way, and this I think is sort of interesting, the way that I sort of maximize the prints because I can't fit the figure, which is 100% scale on one page. So here are three, that's one, three, four, five, six, um, with all the buttons and the, the bugs. So the bugs are there sort of as nuisance. Um, the bees are there for reproduction. Um, and here's an example of how I plan the piece. Um, I make a drawing in Illustrator and and before I get to this point, I'm moving them around digitally a lot because um, the glass is very expensive, time consuming and permanent. Um, and so I have to make a plan and a map of what I'm doing. Um, and then I play around in Illustrator with what the colors are going to be. Um, here's sort of an eventual where I'm thinking of maybe doing gray. Um, and so these are all the different versions. And then I go and I pick the glass panels. This is before they're fired. And this is a digital mock-up that I made to see what it was gonna look like. And you can see it kind of turned out pretty similar to that. Um, here's on the floor, um, cutting out the decals and piecing them together, just putting them on the glass because it goes over several panels and figuring it all out. Um, this is two of the panels getting fired in the kiln. Um, and just to show you in the studio how it's sort of reflective glass. Um, and then finally, this is the installation instructions that come with the work that show anyone who would be installing it, the orientation of the pieces and how they go. Um, and sometimes that's stuff you have to think of from the beginning. Um, and then I brought a few other recent glass pieces before I also just show you um, my most recent solo show, which was in Joan, a nonprofit space in Los Angeles last year. So this piece, um, as you can see, is about 23 inches by 20 inches. Um, and this piece was made from a piece failing and breaking many, many times. You can see kind of cracks in it. Um, one thing I really like about glass is that it shows where it's been broken or cut, but then you can fuse it back together. And um, it's a sort of ethos that I've been working with for a long time, like showing damage, but being strong. Um, here's another kind of color study piece that's on clear glass and um, it's called color grid and you can see the shadows in these details um, for any of you i don't know what what year people are but for any of you that are doing kind of color studies and in, in in your foundational classes you can see the the colors of the shadows complementary this is two pieces called level one and two 
I'm always thinking about how the pieces are installed. So you can see on this piece, color grid, um, there's four hardware hooks. Um, in this piece, this is a new thing that I'm doing, which are these uh, plastic cleats, which you can see through the translucence. I, I sort of never want something to happen to be on the wall by magic, um, which of course could be caused to be happen, you know, to be the illusion that that an artwork has often um, that happens. But I like to kind of show work. Um, same thing with kind of showing the the cuts in the work. Um, I, I, it's a philosophical sort of decision of um, wanting to make work that in, in a way, I mean, I don't know how it, it gets experienced over Zoom, but sometimes people look at my work and they're like, how did you make that? But I never think that when I am making the work, I always think it's very clear, very dumb, very straightforward. This is exactly how I made it. This is exactly how it gets on the wall and it's not tricking anyone. So here's a detail. You can see some of the iridescence and again, the way the image is distorted by being fired onto the glass. Obviously it's levels that are on level. So um, I can't remember the very generous term that John used about witticism, but um, that's sort of my idea of a joke. Um, they'll never be level. <laughs> Um, so that also tells you a little bit about my worldview, I think. Um, here's a piece called Plate, and it is a plate <laughs> on a piece of handmade glass, um, fused. So it's a little bit like a pie in the face. Um, this is another piece that has some dimension. This is just a really kind of bad iPhone video to show you some of the dimension um, and the transparency of this piece. So it's called Broken Clocks and it's a piece of glass that I shattered and then put back together. I shattered it on accident. I never shatter things on purpose just to put them back together, but they're gonna shatter when you work with glass. So that's like the hairline fracture that you can see when it fuses back together, but it's not actually a crack anymore. Okay, um, so here's just some images in my studio of some of the glass pieces. So there's the level, the other, the other direction. Um, here are some pieces that I never kind of made on a different wallpaper piece. Um, some other pieces in my studio, including some that you've seen. Um, just sort of working with materials in the studio, putting them together, seeing what I think. Um, and then just to end on the glass, um, you know, one thing I started making were these you know, I made the, at the beginning, I showed you the pockets for the pieces. And um, these are these little flower containers. Um, I really don't know what it is, but it's something I started making. And I think we could all kind of, you know, use some, some images of beautiful flowers in weird vessels right now. Um, so this is the rest of the slideshow are, are all images of a show that I had at Joan, which is a nonprofit space in Los Angeles. And um, it's a giant 2,500 square foot space or bigger. Um, and it's a nonprofit. So the resources are sort of, sort of um, minimal, although they, they have some resources. And so I was invited to do a solo show there. And, you know, for coming from New York, um, which I don't have to tell any of you, um, the light and the sort of lusciousness of Los Angeles is sort of intimidating. Um, and thinking about making a big space with a whole bank of windows, two banks of windows, um, and making a whole show 
and having the constraints of not being there. If I had to do anything, it would have to be shipped, which is very expensive. Um, and thinking about how to make a show that would really hold the space and respect the location. Um, so I decided to do a sort of like mini retrospective of all the wallpapers I had done up to that point. And these are wallpapers that are sort of at 80% scale that are installed all the way around the gallery. Um, it ends up being about 1400 inches wide by eight feet tall. And again, like I told you at the beginning, I'm really interested in these wallpapers as sort of architectural scale photographs, but that rather than being monumental, like say like a billboard of a person, they are aggregate composite photographs made up of a bunch of different photographs and also some information. Um, so this one is from a show that was in 2018. Um, and then it goes directly into another show that was in 2018. So sort of not perfectly going around the room. On the left side is a show that was in 2017. And then you can see here, there's some pictures hung over the top. Um, in this case, these are two pictures. Um, it's a head is on the left and I can't remember the title of the one on the right, but these are photographs that are directly printed onto um, ballistic plexiglass. Um, here you can see that it's sort of, you can see the, the strainer of the frame kind of on the left and the right, the wooden margins, and you can kind of see the, the picture and also the wallpaper behind it. Um, I had the idea of thinking about Actually, I was thinking about the absurdity of bulletproof backpacks because, um, again, it's this idea that you can save yourself and this idea that you can protect yourself and that you can protect the area that is just your body. Um, and I thought, so interesting to think of making a bulletproof photograph or a window that is bulletproof, but everything around it is totally open. Um, I mean, the one caveat is, you know, this is one of the thinnest ballistic plastics that's manufactured. So um, I did have a friend shoot it with a, I believe it was a 357 Magnum. And the bullet went right through it and melted it. And I didn't, the point was not to be shot actually, or have that, but it's the potential and also the sort of, um, the, the suggestion that something's bulletproof. Um, so yeah, I won't dwell too long on that, but, um, but, I thought it was interesting to be working with this like shatterable glass and then also have something that just cannot be broken, but actually can be broken. Um, so here's some more pictures you can see in this picture of the woman's head. You can see the reflection of the other part of the wallpaper. So that's what the little kind of like pattern on that is. Here's another one. And there see a reflection of another picture. So ironically, like my work is very unphotographical, unphotographable because it's often reflective, transparent, um, weird. And that's something I'm sort of into. Um, so there's another bulletproof picture that is reflecting the windows. Um, so that was another reason why I wanted these pictures. And there's also a series of black and white pictures that are mostly black because I thought, oh, it'll be so interesting the way the, the sun, when the sun is out, will just decimate the ability to kind of discern these pictures. This is one of the black and white pictures. 
Um, so here's some more kind of going around the room. And you can see the windows. Um, and for the wallpapers, there's a mix of a lot of different things. Um, in this case, it's some scans of some um, pedagogical images that I and commercial images that I bought mostly on eBay and also some textbooks and things like that. Um, this is slides of a course that's teaching you how to do a department store display. And then here's sort of like um, on the right, you can see it's sort of iPhoto collections. On the left, it's PDF collections. Um, this is a deconstructed multiple layer um, wallpaper. And this one are all, you can see the green check marks, but which is from my Dropbox, but these are all images that I took of comedians' costumes in the Smithsonian. Um, and then on the left here is documents, FBI documents. It seems kind of random and I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but it's basically a history of my work from 2016 to 2019. And then sort of at the end is this, which was originally made for a document gallery. And that's sort of a remix of all the other stuff. And then this glow reflection was made just for LA. And this image you can see is like almost completely transparent. So when it's on a dark background, you can't see any of the image. You can kind of tell there's an image there. Back to the beginning. These index cards are Joan Rivers, sorry, Phyllis Diller's jokes um, that are housed in the um, the National Museum of American History, which, where I was a fellow in 2016. And then finally, this is just a sort of image of one of my folder systems, um, the way that I organize. And I just thought this was sort of um, a worthy stopping point because uh, it sort of underscores the way I think about making pictures or making work, which is a lot of collection, a lot of inputs, and then it sort of um, gets processed into, into works um, in, in the most strange way that I can possibly explain. Um, so that is what I have. Um, I would love to see you again and take questions. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think maybe a way to just jump right in. I see there are some questions that popped up on the chat. So um, I'll give um, uh, Beatrice the opportunity to uh, turn your mic on and you can ask your question. Hi, um, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I just had a question about the last work that you were showing us, which was, um, do you feel that it is like a journal in a way or more like a composite that has a different meaning or, yeah. That's a cool question. Yeah, I mean, I think there are parts of it that are jour journalistic. Um, and it's hard, really hard in sort of slide form to get into all that nuance. Um, and it's a little bit of like a data dump. Uh, it's very, very overwhelming. Um, but it is a sort of a journal because it's, I think I would think of it as a mix of a sort of like intellectual journal and a research journal and a personal journal. Um, because I'm not, I don't need to be um, sort of scientific about the way that I put the things together. Um, but that is a cool way of thinking about it. Um, it's a timeline. I, I think a lot about um, like a time capsule and I think a lot about 
the way work changes over time, the meaning, um, not just in my work, but in kind of all artworks that, you know, the work is a product of its time and the person that made it. And it's also in relation to the time that it's shown. And that can be any time in the future. Um, and so, you know, I've been making and exhibiting work for about 20 years and it's really cool when things can come and have a new or different meaning based on being exhibited in another time. So I think I try and have faith that maybe if I don't know exactly what it is like now, that I, it's sort of a message to the future. I don't know if that answered your question, um, but it's a cool question. Thank you. No, that's really cool. Um, I like what you're saying, so thank you. Thank you. Um, sh should I read the chat or do people um, wanna? They can. I don't wanna take uh, your job. Well, I, I, can I follow up with a, a just uh, some, a, kind of a question from from that last point and then I'll let people speak up and I don't want to take a lot of time or anything but I, I just when you were talking about the bulletproof glass and this idea of the absurdity of things being vulnerable and I, I was also thinking about the cyber truck the Tesla cyber truck and how there was this I don't know if you saw that demo no where they I, like I mean I remember hearing about it but I don't think I paid attention there's like this whole you know spectacular you know moment of wheeling it out on stage and lots of like lighting and drama and then they went up to throw a like some like a metal ball or something at the window to show that it's like you know impervious to any kind of accident this shatterproof glass and it just smashed the window and it was kind of an <laughs> amazing moment because it was like such a spectacle of a performance and then a, a total failure and then this kind of quick like backpedaling you know to save the performance but um so i was so that last question reminded me about how um like your the the, the conceptual side of the work and the and also the poetic side of the work is so it seems so um integrated with the formal decisions you make um and i was just wondering um because i also see some curiosity about this in the dis rolling discussion if you could talk about how it like to that last point about how things change in meaning in different contexts and different kind of shifting histories if there's if that idea is kind of calculated into the work and you make decisions about a material which you seem to do and that 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 kind of holds no matter what you know space you're showing it in or whether you look at it 10 years later that's it seems like an important aspect of the work yeah, thanks. I mean, I think I'm definitely more interested in care and um, pointing to ways, just pointing to notions of care and protection, diff like as opposed to like a Elon Musk, like self-own situation. Um, but I do find that very funny. Um, but I think that yeah, I think sometimes yes and sometimes no. I think sometimes I'm thinking very, very clearly about that and it's um, it's very stringent. And then sometimes I think, like I say this a lot, like I'm just thinking about all the inputs that I put in, which are all the conversations I have, all the books I read, all the films I watch, all the people I talk to, all the artwork I see, and the way that, I may not be like writing a thesis about that, but it comes out in the work in these kind of material or imagery decisions. So, um, so yeah, and I think like with the bulletproof glass, I probably, uh, you know, I did take it up to my friend's land to shoot it. And the second I did that, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I thought that that might be part of it and i i normally you know it's just in there in the materials list and i don't really talk about it um i guess i'm sort of talking about it yeah because i think it's like useful to know that that's like part of the reason and um and that was the thought that started the whole thing but then when it got to the point to be like you know what i really don't want any of the first lines of any reviews or press releases to be like and she's using using bulletproof 
plexiglass. Like for some reason that just seemed gross to me. And so I did it. I did do it. And I am telling you about it now, but in the moment I was like, I also want this to function as like a clear photograph that's reflecting things that you, and also showing you things behind it. And that's an, also an expression of this idea of like not having control, but also being both a self-contained thing and also reflecting the world around you, which is the same concept as my concept that started the whole thing, which is it's so absurd to have a personal pan bulletproof pizza. You know what I mean? It's just like not a thing. We have to care for everyone. It's not every man for themselves. I mean, it is, as we know, but it shouldn't be. Yeah, thank you. So so then maybe that would be a good time for, um, where is that question? Somebody who is uh, kind of provoked thinking about that. I mean, I, I, that makes sense to think, I mean, all any work should have some susceptibility to changing perspectives or, you know, additional experiences that you then not might maybe reread the work, but I could imagine that not doing the performance of shooting the thing or making that statement allows it to be uh, an act, an action that's implied in the material, whether it's, whether it's played out or not. That, that sounds like that was part of that experience of wanting to stop short of doing that. Um, Michael, is Michael or David? Uh, David uh, Berganza, are you out there? Hello? Hi. Yeah, uh, how are you? Uh, wait, hey. Right. Um, I was just asking, like, I saw that you put a lot of thought and like, uh, you put in a lot of planning to all your pieces of work. Uh, I was wondering about how you would express something that you just think in the moment or like something that you're just instantly feeling and you just want to put it out there it was like, uh, something came into mind after I wrote the question was like, your piece plate something like that? Or are there other things that you do? Um, well, glass is sort of a, especially it's sort of a belabored process. There's nothing instantaneous about it. Every piece has to fire for like 24 hours at a minimum. It's so annoying. Um, but yeah, I think that sometimes the idea or I like the idea, like I thank you for bringing up that piece plate. Like sometimes yeah, I had to make those two separate elements. I had to craft them and I had them around the studio for a while. And I was like, what am I gonna do with this? What am I gonna do with this? And then I think I probably just threw them in the kiln one day and was like, okay. I don't know if that's like the idea of expressing a feeling or a thought. I think that's like, I think we have that a lot in like text message and social media, like the idea that you're like, oh, I just thought of this, or I saw this connection, send it off into the world. And I do my fair share of that. And then maybe that thought like recycles back into the work in some point. But um, no, I think there's not a lot of like action in the making my work though. I do think it's like sort of improvisatory. And um, even though, there is a lot of planning that goes into it. A lot of it happens like just being around the materials and moving things around. And honestly, I think that comes from like 20 years of making things. Like I didn't really understand that until more recently that, that the experience of doing something becomes a kind of language. And then sometimes you don't have to think the thoughts anymore. You just do it. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thanks for the question. I, I have a question, or unless is there, or maybe a comment slash question. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you, Sarah, your work, the, the thing I really love about what you do uh, is that there are these very distinct political 
underpinnings to, um, you know, that are, are kind of activators or drivers in the work, uh, but you really avoid uh, this, this kind of typical didactic space that, uh, you know, political work often occupies. And, and we, I, you know, I saw Timothy Morton uh, tweeted something a couple weeks ago that was somewhere along the lines of, you know, we live in a time where the, 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 the loudest, fastest person um, to speak wins. Um, I, I guess I, going back to what you said about the, the bulletproof glass feeling like it, it's, you thought it was gross, I guess you, <laughs> was the word you used. Um, I'm just curious, like if you could suss out a little bit more in terms of your, your, your philosophy around, you know, what, what the initial kind of signals that your work kind of projects when one encounters it, because there, there is definitely more of this kind of slower burn uh, where things like form and aesthetics, um, you know, interplay with, with these other kind of deeper uh, motivations or conditions in the work. Um, and I, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, be, just because we do seem to live in this time um, where, you know, expressing uh, politics in a more overt way seems to be uh, the preferred, um, you know, model. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe expand on, you know, your, your thinking or your philosophy around art making in that, in that way. Um, um, yeah, sense. I think I followed all of that. I think I got it. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, that was, no, it's that. also, yeah. yeah, I'm, um, well, I think the short answer is I think I've modeled the way that I incorporate politics or concepts into my work, uh, on the stand up comedian or comic, um, and the way in which that, uh, program or that sort of art form digests uh, serious and important information, but makes it uh, accessible and sometimes even entertaining and also the cathartic power of laughter. Um, but I think what you were saying sort of later in the comment question relates to the fact that, you know, being more direct, I think, I mean, I don't know if that strategy even works anymore because um, I think especially with Trump, um, you know, he's not funny, but he has all the tropes of a comedian and uses the strategy yeah. of a comedian. Um, someone, and yeah, so, someone compared it to borscht belt comedy. He thinks he's done. Yeah. Nipples or, yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know if that is a lasting um, approach, but that's definitely my approach. Thank you. Michael, are you you're still out there? I thought that was an interesting question just about the kind of tools you use and how uh, they're se seemingly uh, kind of interested in about in this idea of uh, these design tools, these everyday tools, desktop tools that are then really expanded upon and used to create these really intricate, involved artworks. Um, maybe maybe um, he would ask it more articulately than that, but he wanted to talk about um, the process even before the making of the work, but just some of those um, planning tools. Yeah, I mean, I sort of embrace like all tools that can work for me, but um, I really, really like Illustrator because it's, and recently Photoshop is better, but earlier versions of Illustrator were better for this um, because it's to scale. You can scale things up to very, very big. So, and it, doesn't get you bogged down in like modeling. It's basically like a diagram. Um, and I've used it for a lot of different things, but I use it for all kind of technical drawings. I don't really do 3D modeling or sort of like CAD. I don't know that 
very well. Um, so I just use Illustrator to kind of mock up everything. I do it for elevations, for exhibitions, um, and for individual pieces. Um, just another tool. I think if I'm looking in the chat correctly, the question is sort of like, oh, not thinking about using that to make a big thing. But I think, and also I don't think there's a right or way, wrong way to do anything. I think you just have to come up with your own set of processes. But also um, this using stock images seems like it's part of the language of that, that software as well. Um, that is an interesting observation. In my case, it comes from um, my photo history education. And um, I studied the history of photography with Deborah Bright. And that was a year long program. And you become just so hyper aware. I became so hyper aware of the subjection um, that photography has been endemic of since its inception. And so I sort of made a decision to opt out of making images, especially of people, but yet I still want to represent people. And so I have to think about a level of sort of complicity. And then also like if a picture of a tape measure already exists and someone did it and it's fine, there's no reason I need to put another picture in the world of that. I mean, I am effectively by making it a work, but um, it's essentially like a work ethic also, which is um, I have a full-time job. I've always had a full-time job. I need to make work. And so anything that's going to make it go more quickly for me and that's going to make it more accessible for me to do it, I'm going to do. Um, thank you for taking, talking a little bit more about that. Um, so there, this is a good opportunity to talk directly to the artist. There's anyone, any um, last questions out there, comments? I had a quick um, question. Um, I was wondering if it says you like journal these pictures all the time. Do you have any certain pictures that you have just been like dying to use and you can't seem to work them into a work yet? Or and if you do, how do you deal with that? I know I have like ideas that I float around and when I can't seem to get them to work out, you want to get frustrated. But I liked what you said about how you view it as like a journal for your future self almost to look back. So I was wondering if that changes how you think about it. Oh yeah, I have so many things that are just deep failures that have been worked on a lot. Um, so, I mean, they sit in folders, like computer folders, or they sit in piles. There's things that I'm attached to for whatever reason. Um, and yeah, that happens all the time. I can't think of a single like iconic example, but it's just like, yeah, my sort of archives are lousy with all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that's also really interesting because I've had so many ideas for artworks over the years and um, some of them just get, don't get made. The ones that get made are the ones that are your work, you know, like I have so many things that I'm like, why didn't I ever make that? Or, and I, I, I'm constantly kind of like moving on, you know? So I think just sort of, it's good to hold on to the things that you're like attached to because they give you an idea and they give you a sense of who you were or who you are. But it's also just good to be like, well, I guess I never made that one. I guess I made this one. This is, this is my work, you know? And I try only to make works that I really want to exist in the world. Great, thank you. Um, I guess I kind of have a quick question. I read it in the chat. I wasn't sure if you saw, um, but I was sort of wondering, uh, 
when you spoke about the glass pieces breaking and putting them back together and you can sort of see a reminiscent um you know hint of that in the work um i was wondering if like when you first began to work with this material if you found yourself in a process of trial and error and continuing to get it perfect every time or if you fully accepted it from the start um, and sort of embraced the uh, the fact that the material was vulnerable and strong at the same time, like you mentioned. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, I think the answer is kind of both. One, um, constantly learning, experimenting, failing, succeeding, you know, making, remaking, constantly, constantly. But at the same time, I started make, working with glass in 2017. Um, you know, glass, ceramics, metal, all these especially types of crafts, um, photography, painting, like anything that has a craft associated with it is also gonna have a real long list of the things that you're supposed to do to do things correctly. And they're gonna have people who have been practicing and working in that material for years and years and years. And that is a real known expertise. So it's a little bit hubristic to be like, I'm gonna work in this material now, but I've never done it before. Um, and that is on the one hand. And then on the other hand, when I started working in it, and you know, there's people who have 20, whatever, 30 years of working exclusively with glass, because that's their thing. And it's like a real subculture. And you're just like, can I do this? Why not? Can I do that? Why not? You know, um, wait, why do you do it that way? And like some things you understand and you understand you have to do it that way. And other times you're like, I don't really think I need to do that. Um, but I really understood, like I was saying sort of at the beginning that I know how to make things because I've been doing it for a long time. And I've been through education um, processes. So I had the sort of some level of confidence that I could figure out how to make something as long as I had a level of humbleness, you know, in front of the glass that can cut you, in front of the fire that can burn you and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I just sort of went for it. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, so are there a couple other comments? I want to make sure that everyone's voice is heard there. If you want to speak up. Um, okay, so I don't know how you're feeling, Sarah, if you have time for one question more or does anyone sure, have Sure, I can do one more, sure. Uh, uh, who, who, who out there would like to take this opportunity? Um, uh, well, I, I um, really appreciate your talk tonight. It was very interesting to learn more about your work and, and thank you for for um, being here with us, um, wherever we are exactly <laughs> right now. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it, it, was, it was really great to have you here. Oh, thanks so much to everyone for uh, tuning in. I, I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for the great questions. Good luck with the rest of the semester. Yeah, you too. Put your masks, stay six <laughs> feet apart. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's what I saw every couple of miles on my drive here today. The the governor's message in big LED display. Uh, is it so much to ask? Just wear a mask. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, again, thank you very much, and 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 thanks everyone for your um, questions. And we'll meet back here again next week and we'll, we'll we look forward to also seeing um your work out there where, where, wherever we next encounter it thank you sarah thank you thank you guys
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank Night. you.